Welcome to lecture 5. Let me again summarize briefly where are we coming from and where are we going hopefully. So by now you should have all the basics that you need to study quantum information science in details. We started with the set of rules. It was all about probabilities and probability amplitudes. So we started with amplitudes and probabilities. And essentially the message was quantum theory is a new kind of probability theory and the way you calculate probabilities you use complex numbers called probability amplitudes. You have to add probability amplitudes instead of probabilities, take mod square, get probabilities. A non-trivial consequence of this approach is um, this one extra term which is called quantum interference which makes all the difference to statistical predictions. And uh, we started looking at quantum interference at the um, single qubit level, right? So we had one qubit. And that was a good excuse to introduce quantum logic gates, quantum operations, that uh, the one that you should remember is, of course, this one. Hadamard phase Hadamard. And I was telling you that with the Hadamard and uh, any phase gate you can do anything you want on a single qubit level. Then we thought, yeah, one qubit is just a bit boring, right? So let's bring two qubits together and see what we can do. So it's again quantum interference, but this quantum interference now has consequences because we have subsystems, we can take them far away from each other, and then we essentially have a new phenomenon which we really like in quantum information science, and that's called entanglement. And uh, that came, again, that was an excuse uh, for us to introduce few more quantum logic gates and uh, your all-time favorite is control knot. So we have two qubits now and we have control knot operation. And together with Hadamard, it will generate a beautiful entanglement of two qubits. And then we were talking about um, Pauli gates, Clifford gates, and um, the T gate, which is a pi by four phase shift gate. And uh, we concluded that um, they allow us to construct any unitary operation on any number of qubits with any precision of our choice. So essentially, it's so beautiful, isn't it? Just we have those little building blocks and we can construct any unitary of our choice. But then with quantum entanglement, we are facing a big problem. So we say, okay, we can associate a quantum state as a state vector to a combined system of uh, say two or more qubits. But uh, because of the nature of entanglement, we cannot attribute a state vector almost by definition, right? We cannot attribute a state vector to a subsystem. So then we had to come up with another tools to describe quantum states which sort of allow us to go from system to subsystems and sort of uh, retain the concept of a quantum state. So we introduce density operators. So we talk about partial traces, how we go from a system to a subsystem level and how we can actually associate density operator with, with any subsystem of your choice. Uh, we talk a little bit about ways you should look at density operators. We talk about quantum ensembles of states and uh, and we show that essentially it doesn't really matter whether you think in terms of partial traces um, or whether you think in terms of ensembles for all practical purposes. They give you the same kind of description of density operator. So at this stage we are essentially done with the basics, right? Now we are going to take all the tools and uh, play with them a little bit. So it's, in a way, it's becoming more interesting. As I told you, there are essentially two paths to go. So now one of them is just to explore the power of quantum theory, of power of quantum interference, power of quantum entanglement. And uh, I would like to illustrate this power with uh, two topics. Um, so one is going to be secure communication and the other one will be quantum computation. So we'll, we'll be talking, our lecture five will be about secure communication and then we will move on to quantum computation. 
So this is essentially to show you that there is something there, this, this extra interference term, um, whether it manifests itself as a quantum entanglement or otherwise gives us something that we cannot quite reproduce, at least not with the same level of efficiency at the classical level. Um, but there are problems, of course, you know, as always in life, you know, it's just, it's too good to be true, right? Um, so you have to um, realize that uh, all this quantum devices, quantum interference is very sensitive. I mean, it's very fragile to any external perturbation. So any open quantum system, and most quantum systems are actually open, they interact with everything, uh, not only with what you want them to interact, they interact with environment and so on and so forth. So you cannot control them really truly. And uh, so that means that we lose uh, this power and uh, this will bring us to the notion of the coherence and the evolution of um, open quantum systems of decoherence. But in general, we'll just look at the evolution of open quantum systems. It's not going to be unitary anymore. It, it can be, but it, it doesn't have to be. So it's just if you have two entangled subsystems and the, the whole may evolve in a unitary way, but if you, if you track the evolution of one of your subsystems, it, it doesn't have to be unitary. And we will talk about it. So at the end, sort of a bit of a good news, right? Is that um, we can do something about it, and then we will talk about quantum error correction. In the early days, we call it recoherence here in Oxford, but somehow uh, many ideas were mm. brought from the classical area of error correcting codes and so on and so forth. So today, it's just we talk about quantum error correction and fault tolerant computation. So that's the plan. So off to secure communication then.